We go to this gentleman with complicated subject matter from foreign policy to politics, professor of international relations, political scientist, journalist, podcast host. He's the founder of the Rothkopf. I'm sorry. How do I? I'm Rothkopf. I'm sorry. I forgot how to pronounce your name, David. My apologies. Rothkopf. Is he saying it right, David? Sounds good to me. All right. The, the F at the end is silent? Yes. Well, not really, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Kopf. 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 How does it feel? We'll keep this all in, Dan. <laughs> David Roth. Yeah. Kopf. Please do. Uh, <laughs> Why are you having so much trouble is, with it the second gold. time you're speaking to him? It's the PF that, that complicates it. Roth. Kopf. Fair play. Thank you. Keep it all in. I'm begging hey, you. Stugat was right. Oh. Holy <laughs> Stugat was right. Congratulations. I'm just going to call him David. Former senior official in the Clinton administration, noted author, commenter, Gee. expert on national security and foreign policy. Hope he's the host <laughs> of Deep State Radio. Dave, thank you for being on with us. Explain what's happening to our listeners. Ukraine and Russia, everything at the border is complicated. Is there a war that is imminent? You know, I wish I knew. It would make this a lot simpler uh, as, you know, in terms of how your listeners can prepare for it. But the reality is nobody knows except Vladimir Putin. He's got 150,000 troops arrayed around the border of Ukraine. They are arrayed in a way that they could start attacking at any minute. They've been launching cyber attacks against Ukraine for the past few days, which everybody thought would be a prelude to war. Um, on the other hand, Putin said he would de-escalate, and there are diplomatic discussions going on all the time. Today, the Secretary of State said that um, there was no sign of de-escalation. And that's no surprise because Putin lies a lot. Um, but uh, of course, people hope for it. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to know for a while because, you know, the the likely de-escalatory move of Putin is, you know, move ten thousand troops off the border and keep one hundred and forty thousand there, uh, which leaves all his options open. Uh, so, you know, if somebody tells you they know, they're lying. When Russia reports military exercises, we just assume it's a lie because of the positioning? No, I think you assume it's them preparing uh, to to launch an attack, but also signaling, you know, the sending a message. We are ready. We understand the terrain. Our troops are battle tested. Of course, they've been fighting one way or another in Ukraine since 2014. So that, you know, they're 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 pretty experienced there. Um, but, you know, it's the middle of the winter uh, and they're sending a message, which is we are deadly serious. Now, whether the goal is to achieve some diplomatic breakthrough, to intimidate the government in Ukraine or actually to seize territory, we still don't know. When Biden threatens significant sanctions, financial sanctions, and then there is some movement, is America actually doing something? When there's some replacement of the troops, is it because of the threat of sanctions or is it coincidence? No, no, I think it's it's real. The Russian economy is fragile. You know, it's not that big an economy, first of all. You know, the Russian economy is the size of the Italian economy. Um, and Putin has been doing kind of lousy job as a president, and so there's a lot of weakness within it. It's really dependent on one thing, and that's energy exports. Um, and uh, if the United States were to uh, work with the Europeans to cut off flows of Russian gas to Europe, that would be extremely painful for the Russians. If the United States and Europe were to target the bank accounts of uh, the, the oligarchs around Putin or Putin himself, that would be extremely painful. If they were to make public the amount of money that Putin has stolen or what he's got squirreled away in bank accounts around the world to drive home the message to his people that Vladimir Putin became the richest man in the world via uh, you know, unprecedented corruption, that would be damaging to them. So there are a lot of things where we, we have some leverage uh, and we're trying to use all of it right now. Financial sanctions do what to Russia? If 
if you were to be in the mind of Putin now, explain to me how much of a de- you just did, but how much of a de- deterrent that might actually be. Are you saying that you believe that the United States can prevent this war with these threats? I, I don't, because Putin might say, you know, uh, my people can suffer for a while. I'm not going to feel it. My oligarch friends aren't going to feel it. And, you know, typically when I go and, you know, get a little more land for the Russian people, uh, I get a boost of popularity. So, uh, you know, it, it, you know, he might see it as worth the cost. Uh, having said that, the, the pain is going to be fairly significant. They're not going to have crucial revenues. Uh, for for the government from the, the energy sector, they're not going to be able to move money from their bank accounts in Russia to bank accounts around the world. They won't be able to pay their debts. Um, and it may be that some Russian oligarchs who have billions of dollars, you know, tucked away here and there won't be able to access their money. Uh, and, you know, I think the calculus of the U.S. and the Europeans is if that happens, those Russian oligarchs are going to start calling up Putin and say, what are you doing, buddy? This is hurting us. I mean, there was even a proposal in the UK to, you know, kick the Russian oligarchs kids out of, you know, UK boarding schools uh, because they know that these are the only people Putin actually talks to. And so squeezing them could have an effect. So, David, if they indeed pulled back, what would be the reasons for doing so? Well, I think they would be afraid of the cost. I think they might have calculated that invading was a was a kind of a bad idea. Uh, you know, you, the people of Ukraine are going to fight back. The Russians have a bad experience from their own time in Afghanistan, where they got involved in a long guerrilla war that ultimately helped bring down the former Soviet Union. Uh, and I think they have discovered that a couple things they were counting on aren't true. They thought the U.S. was weak and divided, not on this, and they thought NATO was weak and divided. Not on this, you know, everybody's pulling together. Uh, and so they realized that we will be able to turn up the heat on them and they're not going to get the concessions they wanted. What happens if they ignore NATO? And do what? And invade? Atta- and invade, yes. What happens? What plays out when the world disapproves? Well, I mean, they, they invade. The day they invade, we impose a group, you know, sanctions on Russia. Uh, the Russian economy starts to feel the heat. Russia becomes a pariah state. You know, at whatever, you know, sort of standing it has in the world deteriorates further still. They then go into Ukraine and the Ukrainians fight back. And they fight back not only uh, with the resolve of people who are defending their own country, but with a lot of aid from Europe, $1.2 uh, billion in aid from the Europeans, a billion dollars in loan guarantees from us with a lot of lethal aid from us, uh, weapons and and weapon systems. We've been helping them to train. Uh, They're not going to be pushovers. Uh, And as body bags start going back to Moscow, Putin's going to have to explain that. Um, And, uh, you know, he's already had this really unprecedented thing where a couple of very senior uh, uh, former Russian military officers have said, don't do this. Now, in Russia, you don't, you know, People who make comments like that end up falling off their balconies, you know. So it was it was quite courageous for these guys to stand up. And it's a sign that the dissent in Russia about this is much higher than than anything we've seen recently. David, you said that Russia has an, an economy roughly the size of Italy. Why do they then play such an outsized role in our politics? And why is their influence greater than their economic might? Russia has 6,500 nuclear warheads. We have 5,500 nuclear warheads. China has 350 nuclear warheads. Russia has 2,000 tactical nuclear warheads uh, deployed, mostly uh, uh, pointed at or in Europe. Uh, the the uh, United States has 100 tactical nuclear warheads. Nobody wants to have a nuclear war, but when you've got that kind of leverage and you've also demonstrated that you're willing to use force in all sorts of ways, whether it's in Syria, in Georgia, in Crimea, or it's using chemical weapons to poison your opponents while they you know, were living in England, um, you know, the people, people are intimidated by that. So they don't, you know, they don't have a robust economy. They don't have the future that China does, um, but they do have a leader who seems to be willing to use the force he's got, and he's got a lot. 
When he says he wants a peaceful path out of the crisis, what does that mean? You don't believe him. <laughs> Why would anybody believe Putin? I mean, Putin lies about, you know, everything. Um, uh, I think what Putin wants is, you know, whatever is in Putin's best interest. The way Russia works is uh, the, you know, the entire country centers on, does Vlad uh, make more money? Does Vlad feel better about himself? Uh, does Vlad have a tighter hold on power? Uh, it's all about one guy. And so when he says, you know, he wants a peace, peaceful path out or whatever, what he wants is to be able to go back to the Russian people and say, see, I got concessions from NATO. They view us as a great power. We're like we used to be during the Soviet days. Uh, that's because of me. Uh, and um, now they're going to you know, give up some missiles or they're going to, you know, NATO's going to be backed off. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, go, you know your question kind of answers it a little bit too, which is, yeah, they're an economy the size of Italy, and yet we're paying attention. And in reality, there are a lot of things we should be paying attention to that are more important in the long run than Russia. How much of a problem, how dangerous is Russia to the United States, just with general perpetual malfeasance? It's a big problem, right? I mean, you know, there are ongoing cyber hacks. Russia's responsible for something, you know, depends on the estimate, but 60, 70 percent of all the state sponsored hacking attacks in the world. That's a big deal. Uh, they are becoming more sophisticated, uh, whether it's with ransomware or, or denial of service attacks or the kinds of attacks we fear might come before an attack here where they start shutting down infrastructure. Um, uh, and they can do that on an ongoing basis. They've demonstrated in Ukraine uh, that they will send their troops in without patches on their sleeves. You know, the little green men, the, what, what we, they, you know, people euphemistically call hybrid warfare, uh, and that they're willing to sort of carve away at the countries around them. Uh, they're trying to expand their influence. They sent, you know, 20,000 paratroopers into another country uh, in their orbit to try to stabilize that country. They're you know, pulling Belarus more closely back into their orbit. He's clearly trying to recreate the the Russia, the Soviet Russia of his youth. Um, you know, it's kind of the world's most dangerous midlife crisis. Although, I suppose he's a little <laughs> past midlife. But, but, but you know, it's it's the same thing. You know, I mean, this is an old man who's trying to recreate uh, what he remembers from his youth, and. You know, that's dangerous. That's typically a very dangerous thing, whether it's in your family, it's in your neighborhood, or it's in geopolitics. How does he succeed? Uh, he succeeds by staying in power, by, you know, gaining another hundred billion dollars, by um, being able to tell his people that uh, NATO and the U.S. Uh, respect them. Um, but, but honestly, I, I don't think he succeeds. I think in the long run, he ages, he weakens, uh, dem dem democracy movements in his country remain strong and get stronger. And, you know, NATO didn't have a mission for the past 30 years, you know, for, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden, they do. There is nobody in NATO who doubts that they've got to be focused on Russia. Sweden and Finland, which aren't in NATO, are considering joining NATO. Putin could come out of this with NATO bigger, NATO stronger, NATO more resolved, the U.S. in a stronger position in the world, uh, the U.S. seen as a leader um, in a way that it hasn't been in a long, long time. And, uh, you know, that's kind of lose-lose for Vlad. Isn't the ego of that, though, that you feel that you have to ignore your advisors who are being publicly dangerous, these oligarchs. I'd like to ask you more about that relationship, incidentally. I, how do you know about what the relationship is with these oligarchs in a secret state? Well, first of all, you know, we have lots of sources. Secondly, nobody makes a lot of money in Russia without the blessing of Vlad or without Vlad getting a cut of it. Um, and, you know, these are the people who control the vital industries, the vital media resources and so forth upon which Putin depends. The country is run by a little club, uh, not by, you know, government per se. Um, and you see that by who rises, who shows up with him, who's got the cash, who's got um, the clout. And, um, you know, he's, 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 
you know, so, you know, in a, in a kind of interesting way, and it's a bigger, longer story, you know, the KGB saw the Soviet Union falling and they said, okay, what do we do? And they took some of their assets and they bought some banks and they invested in some companies and, and they kind of privatized. Um, and they turned, they went from, you know, being part of the state to being a mafia state. And, and that's what Putin controls. And he's the, you know, he's the godfather. How many people are we talking about with these oligarchs who have spread their money all over the world? And uh, how, how many, his brain trust is how wealthy and how many? Well, you know, I mean, it, it depends. There's inner circles and outer circles. There's hundreds. There's not thousands of them. There's dozens that have uh, clout. There's, you know, a dozen that have the maximum clout. And, uh, you know, these are people with billions and billions of dollars, some of whom own soccer teams and some of whom, you know, spent a lot of money to try to buy a U.S. political party. You say it's rare for oligarchs to speak out publicly against Putin or advise him against what it seems he's headed toward. How rare? Um, well, first of all, I didn't say oligarchs. These were military officials. And um, it's rare for military officials who are used to sort of saluting and saying, yes, sir, to do this. Very, very, very rare. Um, and it's particularly rare in this Russia because when people are critics of the regime, they disappear. I was, you know, I said earlier, they tend to fall off balconies. That's not a euphemism. They're thrown off balconies a lot of the time. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, people fall out of favor. But a couple of these generals who are very high up and very respected within the Russian military clearly would not do this if they didn't feel that they had good support within the Russian military. And what is the feeling that they're going to get slaughtered, that it, that no one wants to go to war? Why, where is this advice coming from? You've laid out some of it, but if a military strategist is telling him, please don't do this, is it because you have the world's attention? Is it all the reasons you've enumer enumerated, or are there any I, others? Well, I think the, the, the main reason that the military strategists are saying don't do it is that you're going to lose. You're, you're not going to gain from this. You're going to lose troops going to last a long time. It's going to be costly, and we're going to be weaker at the end of it. You don't feel good predicting, right? Nobody knows. We're just watching this, and this is unpredictable behavior from a madman and an ego-soaked liar. Well, he's an ego-soaked liar. I'm not sure how mad he is. He's, he's, he's narcissistic, and he's, you know, very calculating. A lot of people think He's a great strategist. I think that's wrong because I think we've seen the Soviet Union gradually, or the Russia gradually decrease in influence. Um, but you know, he, he's, he thinks you know he may be pretty good at some tactical moves, and he thinks that he's you know he can figure his way you know out of this. But you know, you're absolutely right. The the the, the battle for what happens next in Ukraine is going on between Vladimir Putin's ears. And if he decides, as we are talking, possibly because of this broadcast, um, to invade Ukraine, well, that's, you know, then it's going to happen. If he decides not to, it's not going to happen. Uh, the sanctions are to color his thinking. Um, but, you know, there is, you know, there is not a Russian government behind it, like, you know, we have a Senate and a House and so on. There's not somebody who's going to, you know, block his path. It's totally up to one guy. And that guy is you, if he's listening. He might be listening. It's possible, given Russia's ability to do everything with our computer systems, that he's listening. I'm sure he listens to your show every day. Right. But not today. today. He's listening to First Take today. He's, he's, a, mean, big, yeah. he's a big Stu Gatz fan. Uh, David, thank you for, for being on with us. We appreciate the illumination, sir. It's my pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you, D. Trouble, it? Have you guys been given permission to talk about this musical no. because Mike is out there <laughs> no. going crazy? And Zero. I don't believe that Chris is a good singer. I don't no, believe. No, he is. I actually don't even know if this conversation's for air. He oh, might. Yeah. He might get. No, it is. I mean, you know, out. we can say that Chris is a good singer. I don't know because I, well, Mike is, is actually, very this sensitive isn't even about, about this. the musical. This is just I heard him sing in the car. Right. He's yeah. not a good singer. I heard him sing, and he's not a good singer. And I believe that all of this stuff, everyone needs to like really lower their expectations on what it I is totally that they disagree. think about this. Because, Chris, it, there's just no way. I don't care how good the producers are. 
Chris Cody. He is a good singer, no, Dan. No, that's not. I heard him sing. He I'm does it. putting my reputation on the line. I heard him Whoa. sing without any. What does that mean? Any, what does what, that what mean? Do you mean? Well, ne- well mean? the next time that Jess offers her reputation, then we'll take it less seriously. You know, exactly. it's a reputation. But right. it's, it's not very being, important. It's not being it taken my seriously name. here. Like Dan does not believe her. Hmm. I heard him sing for myself. She's not right. I don't even know. She's wrong, and therefore her reputation is now on the line, and now what do I do with the tattered remains of her reputation? I really don't know why I tagged my reputation <laughs> on Chris, Chris Cody. Cody. Ruined now. Anything with ruined. Chris Cody, I don't know why I would do that. I don't regret it, because I do believe you that I'm right. Now, we also shouldn't lower our expectations, because we might all be terrible singers. We, but we are have an all incredible terrible. producer. We, JT Daly is like, I heard my oh singing my God, voice, so and I know that I'm appalling. And so he is. The I, will, idea... I will stake my reputation on that. Witty is awful at singing. He is tone deaf. He cannot carry a note. But Whoa, I think you're still going to sound really good. Probably a step too far. He might have taken that too far. Jessica, yeah, you, you came in here. Reduce your expectations, everybody. No. Reduce your no, expectations. Raise them. No, raise them. This is going to be incredible. No, absolutely not. Do not believe. I've heard all of you sing in there. I've heard all of you. There, there Who's is a li- the best? There's a little studio yeah, rate over us, rate there. Us. Rank us. Who's your favorite? They're calling it five. Studio Shitty instead of Studio City because it's just a bunch of boxes stacked on top of each other. And this poor Grammy-nominated artist is just buried in boxes with horrific singers. Poor nothing. I saw what he was billing. Well, it, that he's expensive makes the studios no less shitty. By the way, Chris Cody pointed this out while we were in L.A. We like to name things after poop. Yeah. Super Bowl week. Yeah. The turd deadline. Studio shitty. It it's a lot shitty. of poop-based jokes. Yeah. Sound shitty. Huh. Oh, it, and also Mike is saying it's sound shitty, not yeah. studio that, shitty. That right. Well. It's fine. Yeah. Five dollars. I, I, yeah. I request of the audience and everyone involved here, and I'm surprised Mike is in any way involved with shouting anything because he's been super secretive about this project. And weirdly, weirdly, uh, just erratic about this project. Dan, I've had this clip on my phone for over a week now of Stugatz singing that I have just <laughs> no, been he's the worst. dying oh, he's, to oh, play he, on the show. Been, it's you said, so dead funny. last. He's the worst. <laughs> uh, We're not allowed to. Just play it for us on your phone. And there's an embargo, says uh, Mike. Embargo, yes, yeah. I, but it's the, it, <gasps> it. It was unrecognizable as word or song and just dreadful. You know what I said to JT? I said that he is a Grateful Dead fan, and I think the Grateful Dead might ruin your relationship with other forms of music. And I've noticed this both in terms of his singing voice and when he, like, chair dances. He is the most off-rhythm chair dancer I have ever seen. And I think it's purely Grateful Dead-based. I think it warps your sense of, like, how music is supposed to sound. It's the drugs. (laughs) There's that, too. Jessica came in here, and I've got, uh, she came in here, I don't know whether it was trauma or excitement, but we've gotten, who did you say we've gotten upset? Paul E. Cheesecake is so pissed on Twitter, Dan. Cheesecake or cheese steak? Oh, uh, cheese steak. It's a fun. Wow. Cheese steak. Wow. He's from Philly. He said, going to be real with you, Chief. No one listens to your podcasts. Chief. Wow, Chief. Chief. Thank you for being real with us. He's that guy. Chief. Polly Cheesesteak does keep it real, though. Real dumb. Thank you, Roy. Um, We really got Philadelphia there. Yes. I'm glad we went to war with uh, Philly cheese steak. Uh, Polly. You're, that's a you're real e, dumb. Like the middle name's E. I don't know what yeah, it stands yeah, for, though. You're real dumb, Paul E. Cheese steak. So what's happening? Everyone's mad at you, Dan. Mm-hmm. This is what I wanted. war on Philadelphia. Why? Okay, but this is what I'll tell you why I wanted it. Billy, I am so longing for the time where media member X says a thing and local radio hosts unite to protect their region from the slander of Bayless or Levitard or some other gas bag who has uh, dared to, dared to incite the fan base that deserves for their support, strength and backing from all the sports radio stations so that Howard Eskin, who does not know how to download a podcast, can say that we have no listeners. Because he's still fighting the good fight on sports radio, getting Philly agitated, making them mad at this Miami guy. They are roasting you in the quote tweets, Dan. Someone, Let's read them all. Well, all this one's just a photo of the Google image results when you Google Dan Lebitard age. Wow. It says 53 years. That's it. Wow. 
It's also Please. your photo from the Herald from 1995. Ah! <laughs> Seems like the insults aren't that great. So far. I challenge you, Philadelphia, please make content for us. I challenge you in this. Please be clever. I'd like to do a looks like tournament of just insults of me by Philadelphia. Clever insults of me. Can you summon it, Philadelphia? Can you do something here that really gets us agitated so that if we have the blessing of a Sixers Heat series in the playoffs, I can actually care about making another city hurt? Can I ask you an unrelated question? Uh, do you ask any other kind? How many books is too many books? Because D One. had D had a background where he had close to eighty to hundred books. D being David say. Rothkopf, our mm. previous guest. Yeah, right. he had like eighty to hundred books. Do you ever reread books or like lend books? Why don't you donate those books to someone? It just seems a bit showy to me. It's a good question. Do you reread books? Don't I mean, you have a bookcase? Don't you? You have a bookcase. I do. Case? Yeah. You, what, you just have, for show. I mean. It's just for show. Yeah. It's nothing. Uh, I, yeah. I think that you have some. Are they all sports uh, books? Every one of them. Don't yeah. you have a something for dummies in your bookshelf? Uh, golf for dummies. Yeah. Are you not impressed? Uh, you know, just what's the need? I You're do, not going to reread them. I do think it's a reasonable point. Like, what is the point of bookcase other than to store books that you are about to read? Because how often have you reread a book? Like oh. reference books you could keep if you're going to yeah. go back and reference them, but like regular books. like Shouldn't we call, do you want to call him back and waste his time to see if no. they're just visuals that no, are no. there no. for? He doesn't no, seem no, like no, someone no, that would no. enjoy But that it's just, much. do you think no. it's for, do you think it's optics? Do you think he's trying to convey I'm learned? Or do you think he's going back and often looking through those books because he wants a rekindling of something that he read in 1994. Just and this isn't about D specifically. I've just always wondered because lots of people their Zoom backgrounds are bookshelves with a ton of books, and it's like, how often are you actually rereading any of those? Do you not lend more credibility to the person speaking if they're in front of a bookshelf? Put that on the poll at Levitard Show. I mean, I'm doing it. I know, but it's not working for you because everyone can see through the veneer. And especially when you hold the books upside down, as you've often done. Well, the pandemic introduced us a lot to Zoom backgrounds. And there was like that Rate My Background Twitter account. And yeah, a lot of them are book-based. And I think it almost is entirely for show. I believe I've even seen one person exposed for it being a picture of books yeah. broadcast on a television that the television was on behind them, and it was a picture of books, not even actual books. That's awesome. Yeah, the uh, Jeff Passon background is all fake. Yeah. Uh, what? I, I, yeah, I complimented him on his background because he's got albums back there, and it's just all fake. Wow. ESPN and television in general do such a great job with these backgrounds. I remember being sitting in Davie, nowhere near water, and it looked like I was on the intercoastal. Is that is that the shot they used to take of you? That was like there was a Benny Hanna behind you. No, I was I was so far inland. I was near horses, ranches, and could smell the dung. But when you looked at me on television, it looked like I was soaring in a hot air balloon over a majestic crystal bay. There's the poop joke again. <laughs> I'm so into poop. Yeah, football or. Television has some great fakery in it. I'm sorry, that was the last remnant of the Super Bowl still in me. Every once in a while, I just mutter football because I already miss Super it. Super Bowl week, Dana. <laughs> Thank you. Is it Ready still? Row, is it still Super? I don't think Wednesday of the next week is allowed to be. Yeah, don't talking week. about it. I mean, it needs to be the Super Bowl until at least the week of the 28th <laughs> for a lot of these jokes to make sense to you guys. <laughs> Otherwise, I am screwed. What can you tell people about the musical? It's You've a been love story. Bargoing it, it in a way that's. Uh, it really is it's unreasonable. Ode, you're um, you're paranoid. You're crazed. It's an ode to football. It is a this show is a love letter to football. Uh, perhaps we articulate some of our moral conflicts while watching football. We but we all know the most important thing is football. I can give away the uh, the name of the the musical. It's called The Big Game, mm. and uh, it'll be a musical macro look at the NFL season as a whole leading up to the big game in Los Angeles and even some of the songs within the musical will cover what you saw happen on Sunday. A there, musical. It's a a musical. Uh, you're With not going to tell people story. how many how many how many songs you're not going to tell I can people. I tell you right now it's a, it's in the neighborhood of uh, 11 songs. Oh Jesus. Yeah. Wow. So cohesive it's a full-blown musical. I'm, I'm very I'm very proud of it, which is why I'm a little hesitant to give the first glimpse to our audience of 
Stu God singing because then it just says, hey, no, this is shit. And I understand the whole deal. That's our show. Our show always lowers expectations. But we're going for it, right? There's ambition. I'm proud of what we're producing a little oh, bit. Oh, don't tell people and that. I, and, Aren't and they I expecting shit from me? Yeah, though? you're not going to get are, Which is great, but they're, they're, always gonna expect, they're always going to expect shit. But I don't want to confirm their suspicions with an unproduced sound of a raw take that didn't exactly make the musical. Is anyone else concerned with what the final product is actually going to be? Very. Like, I go out and it's like, say these eight words, and now I'm finding out this is part of a story, sending a message, and it's like, what am I? What have I been the signed whole, up for? Because I, I don't know what the message is that my eight words are going to be part of. We don't need to talk about it's this. It's a love story. It's a it's a oh, love story. Love with I was just told this was about football no. and the Super Bowl, and but now there's love. love stories, and who knows what shots I mean, we're going to we, take at cities and we're things. Not, we're and not I'm co-signing right. on. We're not taking. We're not taking shots at cities. Only right. Dan's doing that with Philadelphia. But Billy is right. Like, I'm saying a bunch of things, singing a bunch of things into a microphone. I have no idea where they're going, who they're aimed at, what's happening here. I'm just singing. You well, know? yeah, well, that's by design and partly by choice. You could have been more involved with the musical. You right. could ask me, Mike, what's what's going on with this? Or you could just be very consumed with your job and do putting out really good content for this show and God bless football. And I'll get you in tight windows to make it easy. I, I understand the I complaint appreciate that. that's filed. Like, I come in there and sing eight words, but that's just because I'm trying to make it work for everybody's schedule. You guys don't make it easy. Well, really, what I'm wondering is, today you told me I had four words to sing, and you told me it would take 35 to 40 minutes. It's four words. I mean, it's actually you say the same word four times. Oh, nice. and yeah, it could take now you you're an hour. giving away too much. <laughs> now you're giving away too much. <laughs> but 35, 40 minutes. I'm a one take wonder. I mean, <laughs> you keep saying that and you've never been. It took four <laughs> takes yesterday when he, I don't understand how he does math because he's like, "Woo, one take wonder. And Chris Cody just muttered. It was four takes to God. That was Greg's fault. But, <laughs> but the the update here is uh, we've been in active production. The, the, the timeline then, JT Daly, our, our brilliant musician, Graham and, Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter, has had to work with, is insane. And You're insane. Everyone's been made insane because you decided after the Super Bowl to press the gas on let's do a musical in four minutes. I don't think everyone else has been made insane. I really don't. I've tried to make this as easy as possible. Everyone else has been made insane by your insanity. Well, <laughs> with, with all due respect, I'm here till 7 o'clock at night, and no one's being made anything beyond 3.30 p.m. I feel like I'm living in Willem Dafoe's lighthouse. I saw you masturbate into a bucket the other day. You did? Yeah, but I'm doing that regardless of whether or not we're recording a musical. That's a crime. That's Tuesdays, baby. That's just showbiz. That's the the unspoken contract that we all made. You show, have to say that showbiz through these, baby. You have yeah, to say baby after it's that. It's showbiz again. baby. On Tuesdays, I'm masturbating in the corner into a bucket, and that's just, oh, why that's that just how I get to the hump day. That's show jizz, baby.